Good morning, and welcome to session three of Tools for Analyzing NASA Air Quality Model Output. My name is Sarah Strode, and I will be presenting part three of this training. Our third session focuses on interpreting model output for air quality assessment, and it builds on the tools that were discussed in the first two sessions. Similar to the previous session, we will use the CoLab environment to demonstrate tools, and I encourage you to follow along. Part three has two main learning objectives. These are to apply the tools discussed in sessions one and two to recent air quality events, and to learn how to analyze NASA model output along with observations to visualize the impact of fires and other emissions on air quality. The first two sessions introduced a variety of tools for visualizing modeling output, downloading and subsetting output files, and analyzing data. In this session, we will apply these tools to the GEOS model output in conjunction with satellite or surface observations to investigate air quality. While this training will focus on two specific case studies, the approaches shown could be modified and applied to a variety of air quality applications. This session is organized around two case studies. We will begin with the case study of August 2021 wildfires in the Western United States. I will start with slides describing the air quality event and some of the analyses we can perform with model output. I will then walk you through the Jupyter notebook that was used to create many of the plots shown in the slides. We will then follow the same format in our second case study, which focuses on December haze in Northeastern India. During the notebook demonstrations, I encourage you to follow along in your own copies of the notebook. In order to follow along in CoLab, you will need to copy the notebooks and data files for this session into your own Drive account if you haven't already. The slides from session two include instructions on how to do this. Let's begin our first case study, August 2021 wildfires in the Western United States. This case study builds off the analysis shown in the JESDISC portion of the first session. To set the stage for this study, the image on this slide which was created in NASA's Worldview website, shows the MODIS true color image for our study region on August 14, 2021, overplotted with thermal anomalies from the VIRS instrument to show the location of fires. You can see in this image that smoke from these fires extends across much of the Northwestern United States. The questions we will investigate in this study are, how did smoke influence air quality in the Western United States in August 2021, locally and in regions downwind? How did air quality change over the course of the month? And how did this month compare with previous months and years? We will start with our first question. How did smoke influence air quality in the Western United States in August 2021, locally and in regions downwind? To get a sense of how smoke from the fires was transported downwind, we can consider this series of images for three consecutive days in August. Similar to the image on the previous slide, these MODIS images are overplotted with VIRS thermal anomalies to show the fire locations. We can see both individual plumes of smoke near the fires and the transport of smoke across the region. We also see how the transport and distribution of the smoke change from day to day, moving eastward from the 13th to the 15th. Another way to see the smoke transport on these days is to look at the aerosol index, or AI, from the OMPS instrument. These images were created in the Worldview website, and the red colors show higher values of aerosol index. Aerosol index is a quantity that provides information on aerosol concentrations in the atmosphere. It is sensitive to absorbing aerosols and also depends on the height of the aerosol layer. The aerosol index in these images shows the eastward progression of the smoke between the 13th and 15th, consistent with the true color image. Next, we will use GEOS products to further explore this event. So how can GEOS models incorporate information on a wildfire event? Biomass burning emissions come from the Quick Fire Emissions Dataset, or QFED2, which is based on satellite observations of fire radiative power. Furthermore, GEOSFP and MERA2 include data assimilation of aerosol optical thickness. 
More details on the inputs to the geosystems are available in the RSET training, Introduction and Access to Global Air Quality Forecasting Data and Tools. The top figure on this slide shows the biomass burning emissions of black carbon that are included in GeosFP for August 14. Other aerosol emissions are also included, but in this figure, I'm just showing black carbon, which is one of the aerosol types uh, emitted by fires. You can see emissions hotspots in the grid boxes with fires. The second plot shows the GeosFP aerosol optical thickness, or AOT, also commonly called aerosol optical depth, provided by the tot x tau variable within GEOS on the same day. We see high AOT over and downwind of the areas with high biomass burning emissions. We can then compare the GEOSFP AOT with the AOT observed by the VIRS instrument shown in the bottom plot. Note that although GEOSFP assimilates MODIS AOT, it does not assimilate VIRS AOT. Nonetheless, we see some qualitative agreement in the spatial distribution of the AOT. The figure shown here uses the VIRS level three product, but if you're interested in plotting the VIRS level two data, tools are available in the RSET training on MODIS to VIRS transition for air quality applications. The link to that training is provided here. And in the next part of this session, we will show how to generate these plots in a Jupyter notebook. But if we're interested in other pollutants in addition to aerosols, we can use GeoCF uh, to see pollutants such as NO2 and ozone. NO2 is also emitted by fires. The map on the left showing the GeoSFP biomass burning emissions of black carbon is what we saw on the last slide. We can compare it then to the map in the center, which shows the NO2 concentrations in the lowest model level of GeoCF. And we see high levels of NO2 co-located with the high biomass burning emissions. In contrast, the map on the right shows that the ozone concentrations are locally reduced in some of the regions with high NO2, although ozone production can occur downwind. Studies have shown that wildfires degrade air quality in the Western United States. This figure from Gupta et al. shows aerosol optical depth and PM2.5 concentrations at locations in California. And you can see the much higher values uh, during a period with fires compared to before and after. The map on the right comes from the US Environmental Protection Agency's AirNow website and shows PM2.5 concentrations for August 14. High values are present over much of the Northwestern United States on this day. In our next step, we will compare data from two of those monitors to output from MARA2. So how does MARA2 PM2.5 compare with AirNow observations? At the beginning of the case study, we saw that smoke moved eastward over the period from August 13 to 15. We will therefore consider time series for one station in Seattle, Washington, shown in the black dot here, which is toward the western side of our domain, and one for a station further east, the Missoula, Montana, Frenchtown Beckwith station, which I'll be calling Beckwith for short. And the map here shows those two locations. The time series plot shows the observed daily average PM2.5 concentration from the Seattle and Beckwith sites in the black and dark blue lines. The MARA2 PM2.5 for the corresponding grid boxes is shown in the gray circles for Seattle and then the light blue triangles for the Beckwith station. So to compare the model and observations, we compare the black versus gray circles for Seattle and then we compare the dark versus light blue triangles for Beckwith. We see that at both stations, the MARA PM2.5 is higher than the observed during the fires, but both MARA2 and the observations show that the peak values occurred earlier in Seattle compared to Beckwith. So how did PM2.5 change before, during, and after the fires? Based on the time series in the previous slide, 
we can define periods for before, during, and after the fires, and then make a bar graph similar to the one in the Gupta et al. paper. The bar graph shows elevated PM2.5 at both sites in both Mara 2 and the observations during the fire compared to before and after the fires. It also shows that Mara 2 overestimates the observed PM2.5 at these stations during the fires. In the earlier sessions of the training, we discussed a number of factors that can contribute to a mismatch between models and surface observations. One of these is the comparison of a grid box average to a point observation. To visualize why that can be important, this MODIS image shows strong variability in the amount of smoke over fine spatial scales. Consequently, we expect a surface station to measure different values depending on whether it lies within a plume or just outside of it. In contrast, these values could be averaged together within a grid box. Another possible factor to keep in mind is the vertical distribution of aerosols. Concentrations measured at a surface monitor are sensitive to whether the aerosols occur at the surface or higher up in the atmosphere. While the assimilation of AOT into GEOS provides information on the horizontal distribution of aerosols, AOT is a column measurement, so it does not provide the vertical distribution. We now move on to our third study question. How did August of 2021 compare to previous months and years? The Giovanni demonstration in the first session addressed the question for fire season PM2.5 for California using Mara 2 data. Here, we will make plots in our Jupyter notebook to examine this question using Mara 2 data for AOT at the Beckwith Earth site. The time series here shows monthly mean Mara 2 AOT for the 2000 through 2021, and the red dot indicates the value for August of 2021. You can see that August 2021 stands out as much higher than typical AOT values at this location, but it is not the highest value in the time series. This slide shows a couple of different ways to summarize this time series and place the August 2021 AOT in the context of the 2000 to 2021 Mara2 record for this site. The histogram on the left bends the data by AOT and shows the frequency with which different AOT values occur. The height of the bars represents how many months of the data fall into the given AOT bin. The red dot shows the value for August 2021. We can see that most of the months in the time series had AOT values that fall below 0.15. The box plot on the right illustrates the distribution of the Mara 2 AOT for this site in terms of the median, uh, shown in the green line here, and the quartiles. So 25% of the data lies below the bottom of the box, and 75% lies below the top of the box. The bottom line extends to the minimum values in the data, while the top line extends to 1.5 times the interquartile range. And in this plot, values falling above that are considered outliers and shown in the circles. And we can see August 2021 is the red dot here. So we can see from this that August 2021 is the third highest value in this station time series. To summarize this case study, we found that wildfire smoke affected a large region of the Western United States during August 2021. The impact is seen in GEOS products, as well as surface and satellite observations. August 2021 had the third highest AOT since 2000 in Mara 2 output for the Missoula Frenchtown Beckwith location. Next, we will walk through a Jupyter notebook that can be used to create many of the plots used in this case study. So in this portion of our training, we're going to walk through the Jupyter notebook, firecasestudy.ipnb, and if you have that open in your own collab, uh, you can follow along uh, as we go through it. Um, hopefully, you were able to download uh, both the notebook and also the associated data sets into your Google Drive. Uh, in session two, we saw detailed instructions on how to do that, uh, which you can refer back to. Um, in case you have any difficulty either downloading into your drive or, or with getting things to run during this session, um, this session will be uh, recorded, um, so you'll be able to access it later as well. So we're going to use this notebook uh, to generate many of the um, plots that we just saw um, in the slides describing uh, the 
Western United States wildfire uh, case study. But please uh, keep in mind that this code is for demonstration purposes only, and users will need to check it for accuracy and revise it to fit their own objectives. So similar to what we did in session two, we're going to start by importing uh, some packages that we'll use throughout the notebook for our analyses. Um, we'll also need to install uh, Cartopy if you don't have it installed already. So we'll give that a few minutes uh, to run. While that's going, I'll go ahead and describe um, the approach to the data sets uh, used in this notebook. So um, really for, for ease of demonstration um, during the training, um, I've already downloaded um, the data sets we'll be using, um, and hopefully you were able to copy those into your own drive. Um, and that's uh, to make it easy to just read these into our um, notebook. Uh, however, I also make a note of um, for each data set where it came from and mention some of the tools that we've learned about earlier that we could also use to um, download some of those data sets. So you would be able to customize those in the future uh, if you wanted to look at, for example, different dates. Uh, so for example, um, one of the first data sets uh, that we're going to load um, is VIRS data. And this was downloaded from the LADS DAC, and I provide uh, the website here. So as we saw um, in session two, uh, we'll need to mount uh, Google Drive here in CoLab. And then we'll provide uh, the path in which we're going to find the data. So I've uh, organized in my drive to have all that data under case study data, and you may have it set up that way as well. Um, if you choose to organize it in a different way or have a different name for your subdirectory, you would just need to mod modify uh, the data path accordingly. So now that uh, we've finished all of our uh, importing and installing, we can go ahead and run this field. So once we've uh, mounted the drive, uh, then we're able to read in this beers data file here. So we open the data set and then we read in uh, the variable named aerosol optical thickness 550 land ocean mean, as well as the longitude and latitude. So now that we've run this section of code, we can look over here in our variable inspector. And we can see that we now have this Beers AOT data array and we see the dimensions here, as well as the latitudes and longitudes that go with that. So for our next step, we're going to read in uh, some files from GeosFP, in particular from the AER and ADG uh, collections for August 14 of 2021, as well as a file from GeosCF. And so I'm specifying the files here. And note that I've chosen um, the hour as 2230, um, and that's because this is uh, UTC time, but the local time in our study region for this hour um, is close in time with the Beers overpass. So that's why we chose that particular time. So here I've already downloaded the files, so you don't have to worry about uh, downloading them. But if you did want to in the future, um, as an additional resource, um, I have included a function at the bottom of this notebook uh, that can download the AER and ADG file for a particular date. It's very similar to the function that was provided uh, in the session two notebook. Um, with just the modification that it downloads just this one time for both ADG and AER collections. But you don't need to run that now because we already have the files uh, in the drive. Similarly, to download a different um, GOCF file, you can also refer to the functions provided in the session two notebook. So now we're going to define a function uh, that will read the aerosol optical thickness from the totx tau variable in the GeosFP file. And it will also calculate the PM2.5 uh, from the individual aerosol components uh, following the equation that we saw in the previous sessions. And then we'll call this function giving it the AER file that we specified earlier. Now, Another thing we talked about um, in our slides about the case study uh, was the biomass burning emissions of black carbon. And so to read those in, uh, we need to define a function um, to read the emissions. 
And since emissions are provided for different aerosol types and also different types of emissions, such as biomass burning or anthropogenic, um, we're going to define our function so that it takes in the file name. Uh, the species is um, our choice of aerosol that we want to read. And then M type is the type of emissions, so BB for biomass burning and for anthropogenic. And so the variable name is a concatenation of those things. And so now we can call that function, telling it we want to read our ADG file, which is where uh, the emissions variables are. Um, we want to read it for black carbon and for biomass burning. So now that we've read that in, um, we're ready to plot some maps of what these things look like. So here I've defined a function plot map. Um, I won't spend much time on this because it's very similar uh, to what we saw in the session two notebook. But we'll go ahead and run that. So it's gonna take in um, the variable that we're plotting. Um, you can give it a name that you want to use, the longitudes and latitudes, um, the domain that we're going to include in our map, and also the minimum and maximum values for the color scale. Uh, one important difference um, compared to the mapping in uh, the section two notebook um, is that I've changed the color scale here. And so this is something that you can easily um, customize to put in whatever color map you would want to use. Another thing to notice here is these set under and set over commands uh, that provide colors to use uh, when um, a value exceeds um, the range that we've specified with Vmin and Vmax. So if you see these colors on your map, uh, you'll know what that means. So now we're going to establish the domain uh, that we want to plot. This is for the Western United States. And so it's going from 135 west to 100 west and from 32 to 50 north. And so now uh, we're going to call this plot map function uh, for our black carbon biomass burning emission variable. And we see that it's generated a map, which you might recognize from the slides that we just saw. Similarly, we can call that same mapping function for the tot x tau variable, and then we'll give it uh, the name, explaining that that's the aerosol optical thickness. So now we see uh, this map. And finally, we'll do the same thing for our VIRS AOT that we downloaded first. So one thing to note here, uh, on this VIRS map, um, you can see these uh, crimson points. Um, and so that's um, indicating the values uh, that lie above our, our maximum that's provided here. Another thing to keep in mind is we can see that the resolution here um, for our VIRS data is different from the resolution of our GeoSF P data. And so when we call our map function, we want to make sure that we use the longitudes and latitudes that correspond um, to the particular variable that we're mapping. And finally, we'll make a map of the surface PM2.5. You can also see here um, that we're calling this save fig in order to save our figure to a PNG file. Uh, if we come over here to this folder, uh, you can see um, here's the PNG files that we saved so far. And if we click on this dot, 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 we have an option to download to our local machine if we want to. So next, we can look at um, some other pollutants, such as NO2 and ozone uh, from the GeoCF. So we've already downloaded this um, CF file. So now we're just going to um, open it with X-Array um, and extract uh, the NO2 and the ozone into CFNO2 and CFO3, respectively, as well as getting uh, the lawns and latitudes. So now we can kind of see what this CFNO2 structure looks like. We see that this is a data array and we see uh, the dimensions here. And we also see some information on the attributes. So we get uh, the long name of the variable and also its units. And now we can make a plot of the NO2 and ozone from GeoCF. And so there's the NO2 map on top and the ozone map on the bottom. 
So next, we're going to compare our model to observations at a few um, station locations. And for this, I downloaded the daily average um, data from a couple of stations from EPA's AirNow website. Um, the link to that site is uh, provided in the slides. Um, I did rename those output files um, to indicate uh, which stations were downloaded. And AirNow has data in a variety of formats, but I chose um, the daily means for this analysis. So these are CSV files. And if we want to see what they look like, go into our case study data, you can find those files. And so looking here, we see um, that in the CSV file, uh, we have the date, uh, the source of the data, um, and then we have the daily mean PM2.5 concentration, as well as other information, including uh, the units, uh, the name of the site, and other information, including the site name, the state that it's in, latitude and longitude, and so forth. So now we can read this in using uh, pandas read CSV function. And then if we take a look at what that data frame looks like, uh, this time uh, for the second station, um, we again see um, we now have the date and all of this information, such as daily mean PM 2.5 concentration, uh, the site name, here it's the Frenchtown Beckwith station. Uh, we can see that it's in uh, Montana in Missoula, Missoula County, and we see the latitude and longitude, as well as other uh, information that might be useful. So now, um, for our analysis, it might be convenient to have um, both sites' information uh, integrated into the same uh, data frame. So to do that, we're going to select uh, the columns that we want to keep uh, from the first data frame, and we're going to uh, rename them. So we'll specify um, that in this column name that this is the Seattle PM 2.5. Um, that way, when we merge it with another data frame that also contains a daily mean PM 2.5 concentration, uh, we understand which is which. Similarly, um, for the second one, we're going to rename Beckwith PM 2.5. So we're going to merge together uh, these two data frames, and we're merging them on the date. And then we're going to set uh, the date as the index. Since our analysis is focusing on August, uh, we also want to limit um, our data frame to just August. Um, and so one way we can do that is to add a column called month, um, which is based on our date index, and then to select values uh, where the month is equal to eight uh, for August. And then I'm going to make a plot of the result. So now we've created our, our plot. Um, that shows the Seattle and Beckwith PM 2.5 concentrations uh, for August of 2021. So to compare with these stations, now we need to read in uh, the corresponding MARA2 output um, for just um, the single locations that correspond um, to those stations. And there are multiple ways you could do this. Um, we saw um, examples in the session two notebook uh, for how to extract um, model output uh, for a given location. So you could use that. Um, we also saw that the Jez Disk has a lot of um, tools for subsetting and downloading. And so in this case, I used um, the threads option within the Jez Disk um, and used that uh, to download a time series uh, for a single point uh, for the MARA2 data. And the instructions for how to do that um, are provided at this link here. And so from that, we already have um, in our drive uh, the resulting uh, data file as a CSV file um, for the MARA2 um, station data. And so here we define a function that will read that file, and then it will calculate uh, the PM2.5 from the individual uh, components using the equation that we saw um, in the previous sessions. So since we're comparing to 
um, observations that are a daily average, uh, we also need to take a daily average of our MARA2 data. And one thing we need to be aware of here is time zone. So the MARA2 data um, is in UTC. Um, but if we're going to take the daily mean, we want to make sure we're averaging over the time period that the observations were averaged at. And so you need to confirm this for whatever observations you're using, but I'm assuming here that our daily mean in the observations is in local time. And so since I know that these uh, two sites are in different uh, time zones, uh, we have an if statement here uh, to select uh, the correct time zone um, for our station. And we use this PyTZ package, um, which has a time zone function, um, in order to calculate the UTC offset um, so the offset between the local time and UTC. And then we can add that into our time in our uh, MARA data. And that way we'll be able to use um, the local time when we take our daily mean. And so here um, we are going to uh, resample the MARA data on a daily time scale. So the D stands for daily here, and we're aggregating with the mean. So that's going to give us our daily uh, means from the MARA uh, data. And that's what we'll return from this function. So now we can call the function that we uh, just described above uh, to read the MARA2 output for these two station locations. And then we're going to merge them together on the time variable into one data frame. And we can see here what that data frame looks like. We have the time, which you can see is now daily, and then the Seattle and Beckwith MARA2 PM2.5 values. And we can make a plot to see what that looks like. So now for our analysis, we want to combine together uh, the station data and the MARA2 output. And so to do that, we're going to create a column called uh, date, which is a date time object based on uh, the index in our MARA2 data frame. And then we can use that to merge together with the date um, of the ob observations. So now if we look, we see we have the date, which is now described just as the day. Uh, we have the Seattle and Beckwith observed PM2.5 and then the MARA2 PM2.5 for Seattle and Beckwith. And I'm spending a lot of time here on talking about dates and lining up dates. Um, and that's because as we saw in the session two, um, it's important to have um, co-location in time as well as space uh, when we're comparing uh, the model with observations. So now we're ready uh, to make a time series of the observations for both the sites, for both MARA2 and the observations um, all together on this one plot so that we can compare them. And then the next step uh, that we saw in our case study was we used this plot to define uh, some different periods as either before, during, or after uh, the fires. And so to do that, I add a period column to our data frame um, by default, it starts as none, but then um, dates in this period that I've uh, defined as being before the fi fires, we set as before. Then between these dates, uh, we set it as during, and then for these dates, we set it as after. And then we can group the data according to these periods and take the average over each period. And this sets us up then where we can create our bar plot for the different periods. And so now we see the bar plot uh, that I showed in the slides. And then the next question we examined was, was this month's aerosol optical depth exceptionally high at the Beckwith location? And for that, we needed to consider a longer time series of Amera 2. And so uh, to do this analysis, um, I downloaded um, the monthly Amera 2 data, again, using uh, the threads option at the JES disk. So that's the file here um, that I got in this way. And if we run this, we're going to read this file and then uh, set the time index here. I've added some days um, to make it reflect the center of the month rather than the beginning. 
And then I've also um, renamed this column to something a little bit shorter. And now we're ready to plot that time series. So we here are selecting um, just the tot x tau variable to plot. And then we're going to overplot it um, with the particular time, August 2021, uh, that was the focus of our study. And so there we see that time series uh, with the red dot indicating August of 2021. Our next step is to make the histogram and box plots. So I'm going to put these side by side. So we set up uh, the subplots here. And then we can call uh, the histogram plotting function, specifying that we want to do it for the tot x tau variable. And I've chosen here to use uh, 30 bins in the histogram. But depending on whether you want um, a larger number of smaller bins or, or a smaller number of larger bins, you could choose uh, different numbers here that would suit the amount of data you have and, and how it's distributed. We also then overplot here in the red dot where the value was in August 2021. Then on the right side, we make the box plot here. And that pretty much concludes um, all the figures uh, that we made for case study uh, one. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we used a lot of output that was um, previously downloaded onto the drive, but we don't need to do it now, but below here, I do provide um, some functions that can be used for downloading that data. And now I think we are ready to go back uh, to our slides and start on the second case study. Our second case study focuses on haze over northeastern India in December 2021. This haze is visible in the gray in this Veer's true color image and extends across the northeastern region. This image uh, of the Veer's true color product is from uh, December 22, 2021, and was created in the NASA Worldview website. The questions we will investigate in this case study are, can models simulate or forecast the particulate pollution levels over Delhi in December 2021? How do PM 2.5 concentrations vary on hourly or daily timescales? And how do aerosol levels change seasonally? To look at surface PM 2.5, we will use uh, observations from a surface site, the US Diplomatic Post New Delhi, downloaded from the OpenAQ website. Um, OpenAQ was one of the networks uh, that was mentioned during session two. And this site shows high levels of PM 2.5 in December, 2021. The link to OpenAQ is provided here. The plot shows the time series at this station for December, 2021. Looking at this time series, we see that there is diurnal variability which is the, how the values change over the course of the day, and also day-to-day -day variability. In particular, we see that the concentrations rise after December 19th, and then fall sharply on December 27th. We can now compare the time series of PM 2.5 from GOCF, shown in orange, with the observed PM 2.5, shown in blue to see how well GOCF captures the temporal variability at this station. We could summarize the distribution of the observed versus modeled PM 2.5 in terms of the mean, percentiles, minimum, and maximum values shown in this table and in the box plot. Comparing the means, we see that the mean value of PM 2.5 for this month in GOCF is approximately 3% lower than the observed. In contrast, the median value is slightly higher in GOCF than in the observations. There's a larger range of values in the observations, which have both a higher maximum and a lower minimum. This is not surprising since we are comparing observations from a single site to a grid box average. We now zoom in on the December 18th through 27th event, during which observed PM 2.5 concentrations reached values over 500 micrograms per cubic meter and then declined. The figure on the left shows that GOCF reproduces the timing of the increase and subsequent decrease. 
but it underestimates the peak values and overestimates the values at the end of the period. And that's shown uh, here in the difference plot as well. So this plot shows the values in GOCF minus the observed values for PM2.5, essentially the difference between the blue and orange lines. Another way to compare GOCF with the observations is with a scatter plot and by calculating some statistics. The scatter plot here shows the GOCF PM2.5 on the y-axis versus the observed PM2.5 on the x-axis. The solid black line shows the linear regression line, while the dotted line shows the one-to-one -one line. The slope of the regression line is less than one, indicating that as the observed values increase, the increase in the GOCF values tends to be weaker. The correlation coefficient is 0.73, uh, so the R squared value is approximately 0.53. I also show the root mean square error, RMSE. The color of the scatter points corresponds to the time of day, which can be helpful for identifying whether certain times of day are contributing more to the scatter. Here, for example, we see that many of the points that uh, fall well below the regression line are occurring uh, during the early afternoon, shown in this yellow color. The analysis here thus includes the effects of both diurnal and the day-to-day -day variability. The next step of our analysis is to consider these two time scales separately. In this slide, we focus on the daily variability. One way to remove the diurnal variability is to take daily means. This gives us the plot on the left, which shows daily variability in the time series. There is good agreement between GOCF and the observations for the timing of the increase and decrease. If we were interested in the peak values, we could also consider the daily maximum instead of the daily mean. And this is shown in the figure on the right. We can see that GOCF has a larger underestimate in the daily maximum compared to the daily mean. We can also look at the diurnal variability. There could be multiple ways to do this, but here we average over all the days of the month for each hour in the day to create an average diurnal cycle. And that is shown in this figure here. GOCF reproduces the general shape of the diurnal cycle. Though the amplitude of the cycle, defined here as the maximum minus the minimum, is somewhat smaller in GOCF compared to the observations. Session one of this training discussed the difference between the GOCF replay and forecasts. So far, we have been using output from the GOCF replay. However, if we are interested in predicting air quality, we can consider the forecasts instead. This figure shows five-day forecasts of PM2.5 from GOCF for three consecutive days, indicated in the large dots. For comparison, it also shows the replay in pink and the observations in black. So you can see how the forecasts diverge from the replay over time. The paper by Keller et al. 2021, uh, which is provided, um, the link is provided here, provides an evaluation of the GOCF forecasts. For the final portion of this case study, we zoom back out to consider the seasonal cycle. The animation of monthly mean modus AOT, shown here, which was generated in Giovanni, one of the tools shown in session one, shows seasonal variability over Northeast India, with the region of maximum AOT shifting southeastward over the year. We will now look at this seasonality in Mara 2 and also ask the question of what aerosol types contribute to the seasonality in different areas. In addition to total AOT, which can be compared to satellite observations, MARA2 provides the AOT for each aerosol component. Since the MODIS AOT animation showed different seasonal variability between regions, we will examine the seasonal cycle of AOT in MARA2 for two locations, the Delhi location that we examined earlier, and another site, Putna, located farther southeast. The map below shows the approximate location of these sites on top of a true color image created in NASA Worldview. 
So here we look at MERA2 AOT by component. The bar plots show the MERA2 AOT for the Delhi and Patna sites averaged over 2020 and 2021. While the, bottom, while the top of the bars indicates the total AOT, the colors of the bars show the AOT contribution from each aerosol component. We see that in Delhi, the dust component, shown in orange, drives a maximum in June. In contrast, in Putna, the peak occurs in December, with the largest contribution coming from sulfate aerosol. To get an idea of where sulfate aerosol might be coming from, we can look at a map of the December anthropogenic SO2 emissions in MERA2, which comes from the SO2 MAN variable. And that map is shown here. In summary, for our second case study, we analyzed the daily and hourly variability of PM2.5 at a surface station compared to GOCF output, focusing on an episode of enhanced PM2.5. GOCF captured important aspects of the temporal variability, although some biases were present. Meteorological data from GEOS and other NASA products could be used to further interpret this comparison, although we did not include that here. We used the MERA2 time series to compare the seasonality of two different sites in Northeast India and the contributions of different aerosols. We will next step through a Jupyter notebook to show how many of these plots were created. Please remember that these routines are examples only. Users should check the code for accuracy and can modify it to fit their specific analysis needs. In this portion of our training session, we're going to walk through the Jupyter Notebook, India Case Study IPINB, which was used to generate many of the figures uh, that we saw in the slides describing the second case study. So I encourage you to follow along in your own notebook. And as we mentioned uh, previously, uh, the, these notebooks are for demonstration purposes only. And so users would need to modify them for their own purposes and to check them for accuracy. And as we did before, we're going to start by importing some packages and installing Cartify. And in terms of the data files uh, that we read in, it'll be the same uh, setup that we saw before where uh, the data that we're reading is already loaded onto the drive, uh, but I'll be describing uh, where you can go um, to get that data. And also, um, as we saw before, uh, the notebook is currently expecting uh, the data to be living in drive in this um, case study data subdirectory. Uh, so if you've uh, placed the data somewhere else, you'll just need to modify uh, the path here to reflect where the data is located. So we'll just wait a minute here um, for people to get Cartopy installed. Now we're ready to mount our drive. Okay. So the first data set we're going to read in um, was downloaded uh, from the OpenAQ uh, platform. And the address for that is given here. This is one of the platforms that was uh, mentioned during the session two training. And I did uh, rename the file that I downloaded uh, to this to indicate uh, where it's located. So we'll use the pandas uh, read CSV to read this CSV file into a data frame. And we can see what the beginning of that data looks like. And so here we see the location ID, we see uh, the site location, it's city, country, and then we see that the time is provided uh, both in UTC and in local time. We can see the parameter, its value, its units, and the latitude and longitude of the site. In the second session, uh, we saw that it's important to know your data. And one thing that we quickly see when we sort of glance at the data here is that we have these values of negative 999. Um, so that uh, is typically an indicator of missing data. And that's something we want to be aware of because if we're going to do something like take a daily mean, we wouldn't want to be averaging in values of negative 999. And so here, I'm just going to search for all those values and set them uh, to be not a number.
And then I'm going to convert our local time to a date time object for ease of manipulation. And then I'm also going to create another column called date time, uh, which is basically the same as the UTC column, uh, but in a somewhat different format as a date time object. And I'll talk a little bit later about why we did that. And then we'll just set um, this local time um, as the index of our data frame instead of like one, two, three, four. And since our study is focused just on uh, the recent years, 2020 and 2021, we'll go ahead and uh, trim our data frame to just those years. Now we can see what it looks like. So here we have our time index uh, in local time. And then we have um, all this information that we um, see comes from the CSV file. And we have our UTC time. And then we have a date time column, which is um, essentially the same as this UTC column. But you can see that uh, the format is a bit different. And so now we can um, plot this data um, choosing uh, just the month of December 2021 and see what it looks like. And as we saw in the previous notebook, uh, we are saving these figures here as PNG. And so if we come over here, uh, we can find that PNG file. And if we want to, we can download. So in this analysis, uh, we looked at daily versus hourly variability. And so to make that a bit easier, we're going to add columns, one called day and one called hour that refer to the day or the hour of the time index. And then since it's often useful to know uh, the coordinates of our station, I'm just going to print out uh, the station longitude and station latitude. So now we're ready to read in the GOCF output for this location uh, for the month of December, 2021. And uh, this file um, was already um, downloaded to a drive, um, but it was generated by accessing GeoCF through the OpenDAP tool and by then slicing uh, the data set on time, latitude, and longitude. And we don't need to do that now since I've already done it, um, but I do at the bottom of this uh, notebook uh, provide a function that um, shows how to do this. So for now, since we already have it saved as a CSV file, We'll go ahead and read that in. Uh, we're going to set time as the index, similar to how our um, observation data set is, is designed. And you can see now what this uh, data frame looks like. So now uh, we want to merge our GOCF output with the observations. And so to do that, we're going to create a date time uh, column in the GeoCF data, which will have the same format as our station data had. So there's that column. And now since we have our dates in a consistent format, uh, we can use that to merge together uh, the columns that we want from each data frame. This is the data frame with the observations. This is the one with the GeoCF. And so we're matching them up on date time. And then we'll make that the index. And now we can see what our merged data all looks like. And so uh, here we have the date time column, and this is in UTC. Um, we also have the day and the hour, um, but you'll notice here the hour is what we set in terms of local time. And so that's why you're seeing this five and a half hour offset between the hour here and the time here. And you can also see those not a number uh, values where we had missing values in the data. And I'm just going to rename the value column to OBS PM 2.5 so that I can keep track of what that is. And now we're ready to make a plot of the observed and GOCF columns for PM 2.5. And here I've customized the marker size uh, to something that is legible on this plot. Um, but depending on how much data you have and how big your plot is, um, these types of parameters uh, can be adjusted and customized. And now we're going to make a box plot 
And this is similar to how we made the box plot in the previous notebook, um, except that we've chosen two columns to plot. And so you see them both showing up here. And now we're going to print out a table, um, just summarizing some of the basic statistics uh, for this data. And we do that using the describe function from pandas. And it generates uh, this table, uh, which we saw in our slides. Um, if instead of having a table like this to screenshot, we wanted to save this as a CSV file, we could just uncomment these lines here. And then it would save this table out to a CSV file. And so we can open that up here and we see our, our table that we saved and which if we wanted to, we could then download to our local machine. And here I print out the uh, bias um, in terms of the percent difference of the mean of the GOCF PM 2.5 and the mean of the observed PM 2.5. We now want to focus in on this December 18 to 28 event. And so I um, trim down uh, the data set to just those um, relevant dates. And then we can plot just that period. Um, and we can also use the difference function to plot the difference between these two columns. In this next section, we're going to make a scatter plot of the modeled versus observed values and include a regression line and some statistics like the correlation and the root mean square error. We also saw an example of how to make scatter plots and calculate statistics uh, in session two, the Jupyter Notebook, and so that's another reference uh, you could use. In this case, uh, we're going to color code the scatter plot by the hour of the observations to help us visualize how different times of day might be contributing uh, to the scatter in the data set. So I won't spend uh, too much time on this section uh, since we saw a scatter plot example in the previous notebook. Uh, but when we run it, we can see it generates uh, this scatter plot and it prints out here uh, these statistical values uh, that we calculated. The next part of our analysis is where we looked at the daily means uh, versus hourly variability. And so, uh, in this step here, we resample the data daily, so the D is for daily, and then we can aggregate over the day either with the mean to get the daily means or with the maximum to get the daily maxes. We could also look at medians or other statistics if we wanted to. And then here uh, we make the plots of those. We can also um, print out the correlation matrix uh, for either our mean time series or our daily max time series. And so we can see um, what the correlation is uh, between the observed and CF, PM 2.5. And now we can work on plotting our uh, diurnal cycle. So to do this, uh, we're going to group by the hour so that we can take an average over all the days uh, for each hour. And we do that for both the observations and for GOCF. And so that gives us our diurnal cycle, uh, which is what we then plot here. And then we can get the maximum and the minimum of that diurnal cycle in order to calculate the amplitude. And so now we're going to look at the GOCF forecast and how it changes over time. And so for that, we're going to read in um, the CF forecast initialized on three different days. And similar um, to what we did above, uh, these files were created by accessing GOCF through the open DAP and slicing on the longitude, latitude, um, and level. And since I already have them saved here as uh, CSV files, uh, we can just read them uh, with this function here. Um, if you wanted to um, look at different uh, dates, however, I do at the end of this notebook, 
uh, include an example of how to read one of these um, forecast files uh, from the open DAF and select a particular latitude and longitude. So in this case, we've already um, got the files on our drive. So we provide those file names. And now we're ready um, to make a plot. And so we're first plotting here uh, the data frame that had our observations and also the replay GOCF um, for this date range here. And we're plotting those in black and the sort of pink tomato color. Uh, and then we're going to overplot our three um, forecast outputs. And we also then overplot um, the initial time. So we see where each forecast starts. So then the next section of our analysis um, looked at the seasonal cycle. So for the seasonal cycle, uh, I used the MARA2 data um, and I used it for two stations. And these were a station in Delhi and a station in uh, Patna. And so these were um, downloaded from the JES disk uh, using threads. Um, but there would be other options, including some of the tools that we saw in the uh, session two notebook as well. Uh, since I've already downloaded them as CSV files, um, and the file names are here, uh, we'll just read uh, them in with read CSV. And then uh, we'll convert the time to a date time object, make it the index. And the data um, that I downloaded from ERA2 covers um, two years. Um, so we're going to average those two years together um, for each month to get sort of the average uh, seasonal cycle for the two years. And so we do that here um, for both Delhi and Putna. Um, and so here we're grouping uh, by the month column and taking the mean. And we're doing it for all of these variables. And for reference, uh, here we can print out the coordinates of the MARA2 grid boxes uh, that corresponded um, to these two stations. And now we're going to um, rename uh, some of the columns uh, just to something uh, more succinct. So like BC AOT instead of BCX tau unit equals one. And now we're ready to create our stacked bar chart uh, that uses different colors for each aerosol component. Um, okay. And then finally, um, on the slide where we showed this, we also talked about the SO2 emissions. And so uh, to look at those, um, we want to look at uh, the ADG file, um, which I have downloaded from the JES disk already, uh, but we've seen many tools uh, now for how you can do that. And so uh, we're going to use, uh, again, this read emissions function, similar to the last notebook. Um, but this time, we're going to call it uh, for SO2 instead of black carbon and for AN, which is the anthropogenic emissions. Um, if you are interested in looking at the biomass burning ones as well, you could uncomment this line to get the biomass burning emissions of SO2. And now, uh, similar to what we did in the last notebook, we're going to define um, the plot map function. And then we can call that function uh, for our SO2 emissions variable. And that gives us the emission map uh, that we saw. And so as I mentioned above, um, there would be multiple ways um, to get the GOCF output, um, but I've given as additional resources an example function um, to pull uh, GOCF from OpenDAP um, for a particular location and save it to a CSV file. So you don't need to run that now, but that's available for future reference. And that concludes our um, session three on case studies. So that concludes our uh, Jupyter Notebook um, part of this session. And now we're ready to go on to our Q&A.
Hello, everyone. Uh, we're now ready to move on to the uh, question and answer uh, part of our session. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please type them into the questions box so that we can include them in our question and answer session. Okay, so question one. I'm interested in viewing methane satellite data and mapping. Is the process similar to the PM data mapping shown in this webinar? So the plotting function uh, that was shown here um, can be adapted to plot maps of other um, gridded, uh, like level three uh, type data. Um, however, uh, Tropomi is one of the uh, satellites which has methane data, and uh, the link to that is provided here, um, currently as um, level two um, swath data. And it can be read by scripts uh, provided in the Tropomi NO2 training uh, from RCEP, uh, which we have a link to here as well. And those codes are tested for NO2 data, uh, but they could be um, easily modified to work with the methane data from Tropomi. Okay. Um, the second question, is the resolution of Veers around 750 meters at Nader too wide for a small city with a diameter under 100 meters? Suppose we need to estimate air pollution using AOD for those small regions, what could be one of the solutions? So Veers AOD data at 750 meters is available from NOAA. The NASA Veers AOD data are at six kilometer resolution. Um, and the a finer um, than 750 meter operational AOD products are not yet available. Um, there are some dense ground networks in selected cities, uh, which can help evaluate pollution levels um, at those scales. And there are also some land mapping satellites, such as Landsat, uh, Sentinel, and commercial ones, uh, which can be used for case study analysis to assess very fine spatial scales. Uh, for more detailed information, uh, using VIRS is available in the RSET training on the RSET modus to VIRS transition for air quality applications, uh, which is available at the link uh, provided here. Um, question three, a small single question. In slide 29, do you mind to review the concepts that are uh, measured with different colors? You mentioned that orange is dust, oh, what does the other colors mean? Um, I think, um, I don't know if we have a, do we have a way to go back to slide 29? To review, uh, slide 29 is the bar chart showing the contribution from each of the aerosol components. Uh, okay. Yes. There um, we go. Thank you. Great. So, yes. So the legend here um, indicates um, what um, each of the bars stands for. So the BC is black carbon, DU is dust, um, OC is organic carbon, SS is sea salt, and the SU is the sulfate contribution. And question, uh, question four, um, any performance comparison between GeoFP and GeoCF for surface PM2.5 and ozone? So I, um, Melanie or Pawan, um, I don't know if you want to jump in here. Um, I think we only have ozone from the GOCF. Correct. Yeah, so there is no ozone in GOCFP. So if you're looking for surface ozone concentrations, you definitely want to be looking at GOCF. GOCFP is only meteorology and aerosols. As far as a performance comparison between FP um, and CF PM 2.5, that hasn't exactly been done. They're very different systems. So for FP um, and reviewing what we covered in session one in our previous uh, webinar, our previous air quality forecasting webinar, 
FP uses the go-kart aerosol module and CF does have go-kart PM 2.5, but it primarily uses the GEOS chem aerosol module, which also computes PM 2.5. But they're, um, they have different components. Another, an example is the GEOS chem aerosol module um, also includes secondary organic aerosols, whereas a uh, go-kart does not. So there is no direct comparison between them, but the Keller et al. paper that was linked, um, that will have uh, an evaluation of the CF PM 2.5. Um, there is unfortunately not an, uh, a similar evaluation done for FP. For MERA 2, um, there are several publications evaluating the PM 2.5 and MERA 2. And um, when I review, I'll go and I'll link, um, I'll, I'll include links to those pub publications. Thank you. Uh, question five, how can I obtain the documentation that helps me calculate the index, for example, of NO2 or different PM? Um, maybe if the questioner could clarify uh, maybe what is meant here by the index, because um, I'm not sure if we're talking about maybe an air quality index or if we mean like the index uh, in terms of time. Um, and then number six, how is aerosol index calculated? How is it interpreted? Uh, Pawan, would you like to speak to that? Sure. Uh, so aerosol index is actually a not a retrieved quantity. It's a calculated quantity. Uh, so it is typically calculated in ultraviolet region of solar spectrum. So there are multiple satellite sensors which can make measurement in uv part of solar spectrum and typically it is calculated between the two wavelengths so you measure the two wavelengths uh, top of the atmosphere radiance and then you theoretically calculate the same quantity using model simulation so it is a way in which you can quantify the amount of absorbing aerosols in the atmosphere so it is very sensitive to the scattering and absorbing property of aerosols, and it is very sensitive to the height of the aerosol where they are located in the atmosphere. There is this exact equation uh, to calculate it. Uh, I don't remember it right now, but we will provide the link of the equation in the question answer transcript for you to further look at it. Uh, and we will also provide some text for you to read uh, about the aerosol index. Question seven, could you please explain the to-do parts in the scripts for downloading data in session two notebook? Okay, so in um, the notebook, um, I had already provided in the drive the um, uh, as CSV files, uh, the output from uh, the GeoCF, uh, for example. And so um, if you were wanting to apply this to um, a different site or uh, to a different time period, then you would um, want to maybe download different files or extract different locations. So uh, the sort of additional resource um, in the uh, bottom part of, of the session two notebook um, provides a, a function um, that you can call um, for a particular um, date and location uh, that will then uh, download um, the GeoCF, the relevant um, GeoCF uh, output from the open DAP. And then there's an option to save it out to a CSV file if you wanted to have it in the same format uh, that we used earlier. Um, and then there's also an example of how to read in um, the forecast um, for a particular date from GeoCF. Uh, so that you could um, then look at different forecast dates compared to what we uh, provided um, in the notebook example. Um, okay, question eight. How do I obtain the documentation that helps me calculate the emissions, for example, of NO2 or different PM? It is difficult to program in Python without knowing the formulas. 
so um for no2 for example comes from gscf um i believe that the uh no2 emissions um are provided um uh, we can probably provide in the future in this um q a um the exact um uh, location uh, where we would find that Um, and then similarly, yeah, with other emission types um, in the ADG files, exam for example, for the aerosols are the um, uh, the different aerosol emissions. Um, question nine, um, can I take any data from Earth data via OpenDAP? Um, I guess I'm not quite, oh, okay. Um, so there's a link here. Um, to the open data services and software um, from the OpenDAP uh, servers. Uh, so that would be um, a link you can refer to. Okay. Um, Question 10, can these uh, data products be used as benchmark data for setting up a neural network? Um, I think that uh, would probably depend on, on sort of your exact um, research uh, question or, or application. Um, certainly um, you would get a, a sample uh, that you could train a neural network on. Um, Um, I guess one thing to keep in mind is that uh, this is um, model output, so it's a bit different from um, training a neural network on um, pure observations, for example. Um, did anyone else want to add anything uh, for question 10, Melanie or Pawan? No, I think that is good enough. Um, question 11, is the data in context here already filtered, for example, excluding values with cloudy pixels? So most of uh, the, so the um, model outputs we've shown here um, are not uh, filtered um, because in the model we have values um, everywhere. Um, if you were doing a, a quantitative uh, comparison between a model output and um, satellite data where the satellite data had cloudy pixels, um, then that would be something to keep in mind and consider um, in terms of how you do the comparison. You might think about whether you want to then try to filter the model the same way um, as the satellite. Um, so that would sort of depend on your um, research uh, application. So question 12, is this data available for every country in the world? Uh, so the GEOS output is uh, global. Um, so there are um, grid boxes uh, covering all locations.
Okay, and there's a note in the chat that there will not be any assigned homework for this webinar series. Obtaining your certificate is based on your attendance of all three of the live sessions of this training. Okay, uh, question 13. I noticed when doing the analysis of the daily cycle that some null values appeared. Is some kind of quality assurance done to the data collections used before they are published to polish biases from those missing data? Thanks. So um, that's a good point to mention. Um, right, so I think um, each uh, data set that you would potentially use um, will have a different um, characteristics in terms of missing data and so forth. Um, and so really for whatever specific data you're using, um, it's very important to be um, aware of that. Um, and this was, um, so um, yes, if you if you were doing a, a more sophisticated analysis of daily cycles, um, you would definitely wanna keep in mind um, where your missing data was, if there was more in certain hours than others, and exactly how you would want to address that question probably depends on um, your particular application. Okay, um, question 14, uh, could you use deep learning to predict time series using MERA2 data? Um, that's um, an interesting idea. Um, I'm not an expert in deep learning, um, so um, I can't uh, say for sure. Um, does anyone else, uh, Pawan or Melanie, want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, people do use uh, Mera2 for various purposes. Uh, it really depends on your application. Uh, how you want to use, uh, but Mera2 data have been used uh, in combination with machine learning or deep learning uh, to perform or to address certain science question or application question. Okay, um, question 15. Would comparing the model output from MERA2 with ground observations from low cost AQ sensors for PM2.5 be pragmatic? What other attributes should we consider when comparing those values? Um, so, right. Um, it would certainly um, be possible to, to do that sort of comparison um, similar to to what we showed here. Um, it would be important to um, think about um, the sort of agreement between the low cost sensors um, and um, say regulatory uh, sensors. Um, what other attributes should we consider? Um, I think, um, yes, you'd want to be um, aware of, of any sort of missing data or um, data um sort of what the valid data range is and Tawan, would you like to add as well yeah so yeah this is uh this has been done by many people and i think uh, as sarah mentioned it is critical to 
ensure the quality of local sensor data itself using regular to grid monitor that's number one thing and then also going back to the session two part two presentation you had to realize that mera 2 is a 50 kilometer grid versus you are trying to compare one or few sensors of ground monitor so the spatial difference in a spatial scale must be considered uh, while you are interpreting the data output uh, or results of the two comparison uh, the temporal scales uh, are also important uh, whether you want to do on a hourly scales or daily scales or seasonal so i think it depends on your application and for what purpose you want to use mara to according to that your comparison should be done uh, so there are uh, there are uh, intrinsic properties of mara 2 and ground uh, local sensors which can help you interpret the out, uh, res uh, comparison results but there are also uh, problem which are beyond our control such as the grid size versus point measurements the spatial temporal scales and things like that so yes it is doable people do it but uh, be careful how you interpret the results And question 16, how can we relate this product with ArcGIS? Do we need a special training for this? Uh, I think, Paula, uh, you may have mentioned um, something about ArcGIS in the second uh, session Q&A. Would you like to add something here? Uh, so I think, uh, uh, I believe uh, you're asking about how we can actually um, use ArcGIS, which is a GIS software to read and map the output from GIS file, uh, from GIS. So as we discussed in session one and two, uh, there are several tools at NASA Justice, uh, which allows you to output the data into GeoTIFF format. And that GeoTIFF can be easily accessed in ArcGIS. I believe the latest version of ArcGIS also support NetCDF format. So you can actually use the directly NetCDF file also to open it in ArcGIS and perform your analysis. I hope that helps. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, for attending. And as a reminder, uh, there will not be any assigned homework for this webinar series. Um, obtaining your certificate is based on your attendance of all three of the live sessions of this training. And thank you very much for your participation. <laughs>